Hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, my name is Itai, and I'm going to talk today about different streaming methods with Spark and Kafka. So a little bit about me. I'm a tech lead of a big data group within Nielsen, and I will talk about it in a minute. And I've been dealing with big data challenges since 2012. So now it's your turn. Uh, I want to know a little bit about you. So how many here are data engineers? Raise hands. Quite, quite a lot. Uh, data architects? OK, something else? Maybe data scientists? OK, cool. Um, how many of you are working with Spark or planning to work with Spark? <laughs> OK, good. What about Kafka? OK, great. So let's look at, uh, about our agenda today. I'm going to talk about the Nielsen Marketing Cloud, which is the division I work for within Nielsen. And I'm going to present our high-level architecture. I'm going to talk about the data flow in the past and the present, and then move on to different use cases of stateless and stateful applications uh, with Spark Streaming. After that, I will discuss uh, uh, somewhat uh, Spark Structured Streaming, and I'll uh, finish off with a rather unique solution of streaming over a data lake. So about the Nielsen Marketing Cloud, it is based on the acquisition of a startup called Excelate a few years ago by Nielsen, the data and measurement company. It's a data company, which means we collect device-level data from around the internet from both offline and offline sources. So smartphones, laptops, you name it. We provide two different uh, offerings. So we have our SaaS business. So we give our customers, which are publishers and marketers, a SaaS uh, uh, offering which allows them to do targeting on their uh, audiences. And with the data that we collect from around the internet, we enrich it with machine learning algorithms, and we provide different insights, and we allow them to do better business decisions. We also have a DAS business, data as a service, in which we uh, ship out data, according to obviously regulations, et cetera, to different ad platforms. The two main questions we try to answer in our SaaS offering are these. So the first one is how many unique users or unique devices as, uh, of a certain profile can we reach? So for example, if we have a campaign of young women who love tech, then our customer can choose those attributes. So female with this given age range of a given income that live in the US and are tech enthusiasts. This is, uh, in general, the count distinct question. The second type of question is just a simple count question. So for example, how many impressions a campaign received? Looking at our high-level architecture from left to right, you can see that we get, uh, as I mentioned, data from online and offline uh, resources, so HTTP requests and off files, etc. We're talking about over 5 billion events per day. All those events are streaming into our front-end layer, which uh, we call the serving system. And there we process them using basic rules and uh, machine learning algorithms to enrich the data and store it in our NoSQL database, which is Aerospike. We have over 10 billion devices worldwide. All those events are written to local Kafka clusters deployed in our various data centers. We're talking about uh, eight different data centers around the world. From there, all the events are being replicated into our main Kafka cluster, which resides on AWS. And that is where uh, my focus of the presentation is going to be, in the backend layer, which is where we do the big data processing. So we have uh, mainly Spark and some Flink applications reading those events from Kafka and writing them via uh, various ETL processes to our different data stores. So we have Druid as our all-up database, we have our data lake, we have Snowflake as our data warehouse, and other things as well. All those data stores, as data stores provide insights, as I mentioned, to the applications. Uh, so we have the Nielsen Marketing Cloud application, we have business intelligence reports, etc., and those reside on AWS as well. So let's look at the, uh, at the data flow in the old days, and I'm going to use this example throughout the presentation. It's somewhat simplified, but it will show you how we re-architectured uh, our infrastructure over the years. So again, from left to right, you can see that in the old days, what we have were events written to CSV files. Those CSV files were being processed by Java standalone applications, which were stateless. They only did uh, various transformations. 
And then they inserted the data into what uh, was then our OLAP uh, engine, which was based on Clustrix. So Clustrix is just a distributed MySQL engine. Now we used Clustrix both as our operation database, so the OLTP, and also as our OLAP database, and I will discuss it later. Now, remember I said that we need uh, different queries that are mostly aggregations, right? We need to know how, how many impressions a campaign received for a given uh, date range, so we need a place to, to do those aggregations. And in the old days, we have did those aggregations on top of the database, so they were in database aggregations. So what was wrong uh, with those uh, methods? So first of all, we had CSV-related issues. So for, uh, things like truncated input lines, or the fact that we couldn't enforce the schema on the producer of the files. We also had scale-related issues. So we had to kind of manually scale all those standalone Java processes. That's one for a small step for men in uh, 2014. And before I uh, will discuss this slide, I just want to highlight uh, the quote in the bottom of the screen. So Derek Harris from uh, Fortune.com wrote in uh, 2015 that Apache Spark is a Taylor Swift of big data uh, software. So I'm guessing the reason is that uh, Spark was uh, becoming a common uh, framework in the big data industry those days. So as uh, we've seen uh, uh, previously, you all, uh, or most of you know Spark, but just at a high level, it is, it's a distributed engine for large uh, uh, scale data processing. It's full tolerance. And again, uh, it uh, gained a lot of attraction back in those days. And Scala is a functional programming language with, which also provides you with object-oriented uh, capabilities. And it's a first-class citizen within Spark. So for us, in this first phase, what we've done is basically removed those Java standalone applications and replaced them with Spark batch applications written in Scala. Those applications were deployed on a service on AWS that's called Elastic Map Reduce, which is basically a way for you to deploy a, a Spark application, uh, applications in a click of a button. So that's the only thing we replaced in this step. So why is this just a small step? So it obviously solved the scaling issues, right? We know Spark is scalable, so that's uh, good for us. But we still face those CSV-related issues and mainly fa the fact that we couldn't enforce a schema on the producer of the files. So let's look at the data flow in the modern, uh, in the modern days. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this character, Jed Bartlett, the president from the TV series The West Wing from about two decades ago. But he had a catchphrase that said, what's next? So what was next for us was introducing Kafka and Spark Streaming. So Kafka, again, uh, you all know, but it's a highly scalable stream processing platform. Uh, it's kind of the common, uh, the standard de facto in the industry today. And it also provides other uh, capabilities, such as uh, schema enforcement using the schema registry uh, um, component. And we also leverage the AVO format for our messages. The other part here is the Spark streaming. So it was a natural involvement from our Spark uh, batch jobs. Now, Spark streaming is uh, uh, you know, another core component of Spark that allows you to do uh, kind of stream fashion uh, processing of your uh, data. And it does it in micro batches. And your micro batches can either be really short uh, or they can be uh, longer, like minutes or hours. And I will discuss it also. So going back to the same example, you can see that this time what we've replaced is moving away those CSV files and uh, making room for Kafka. So now we have a row events written to different Kafka topics. And those Kafka topics or the events are being read by what, uh, what were then Spark streaming applications. So no more Spark batch applications, but rather Spark streaming applications. And we had long micro batches. And I will discuss it uh, uh, also uh, soon. But what you need to remember is Spark streaming applications are obviously streaming applications, so they're running 24-7. And so the cluster that they are deployed on need to be up and running 24-7 as well. So those were, uh, uh, that was the, the next phase for stateless uh, applications. What we, all we've done here is reading the messages, doing some simple transformations, writing them to our OLAP database, and then every uh, uh, period, so every few hours or every day, we did the same aggregations that we used to do. 
However, obviously, uh, when you fast forward a few months, new requirements were being raised, and the specific use case, uh, remember I mentioned that we use Clustrix both as our operational database and as our OLAP database. Now, that has put a lot of pressure on that uh, uh, database, and what we wanted to do is take the load off of the operational database and move it, uh, or move the mo most of the aggregation operations into our Spark streaming applications, which we know are scalable. Let's see how we've done that. So this slide is a bit more complex, so try to bear with me. I'll guide you through the steps. So you can see the same uh, way, Kafka messages being read by Spark streaming applications. However, what we've done in order to mitigate those, uh, the need to do uh, stateful operations uh, was what, uh, through what we call local aggregations. So on every micro batch, we aggregated the rows of the current micro batch and wrote the state, right? Wrote the, uh, the, the result of the aggregations to the local HDFS deployed on that uh, EMR cluster. Now, on the next micro batch, we, re we read uh, uh, all the messages from Kafka, aggregated that current micro batch, combined the results with the results of the previous micro batch, and wrote it back to HDFS and so on and so forth. Now, Obviously, we need to update our OLAP database every once in a while. So every few micro watches, what we've done is we've upserted, and I will uh, explain in a second, but we've upserted the aggregated data into our OLAP database and just deleted the state from HDFS. Now, if, you know, if you're not familiar with upsert, it's just a, a short for uh, uh, update or insert. So in MySQL, you can do, uh, if, uh, you can do uh, insert of new keys, or if there's keys already exist, you can update the values. So the syntax is insert something on duplicate key update. That's just the up, uh, upset operation. Now, remember I mentioned that we are doing long uh, micro batches. Uh, we're talking about, uh, for example, one hour micro batch. And the reason is that we wanted to uh, load the aggregated data as, uh, as, better, as best as possible to our OLAP engine. So long micro batches allowed us to head to have better aggregation ratio, right? So for example, if I had 300 million messages per one hour micro batch, the output after aggregation could be only, say, one million rows. So it's a, a significant aggregation ratio. However, as you probably can guess, this wasn't enough. So let's see why. So first of all, it required us to manage the state on our own, right? Via those local aggregations on the local HDFS. It was error prone because what happened, for, uh, for example, if my cluster was terminated mid-processing and the HDFS was lost. It complicated the code because we had mixed input sources of both uh, for the same application from Kafka and from the files on HDFS. And lastly, it had a positive performance impact. So consider if you had latency in writing to the database or to HDFS. That obviously made the Kafka consumer to lag. So we couldn't stop here, right? Uh, luckily for us, uh, about a year later, Spark Structured Streaming was introduced as part of Spark 2.0, and let's see if it really rescued us. Um, so just to give you a brief, uh, Spark Structured Streaming enables you to run continuous incremental processes, so it basically manages the state for you, which is what we needed. It was built on top of Spark SQL, so you had various uh, capabilities, uh, for, for example, the data frame or data set API, using the Catalyst Optimizer for better performance of Spark SQL, and many other features like uh, handling late event uh, uh, data and stuff like that. Now, it was in alpha mode in both 2.0 and 2.1 of Spark, but we were early adopters, and as, you, uh, as you've seen, we had a need. So we embraced it and we tried to use it, and let's see, going back to the same example, what we replaced in that phase. So again, the normal way, Kafka messages being read, but now we use Spark Structure Streaming rather than Spark Streaming. The terminology is a bit different, so it's no longer a micro batch, it's a window, but we do the same. We aggregate on the current window, and then we write the checkpoint, and then we'll explain it in a minute, but we write the checkpoint to S3 buckets, uh, and then every uh, window on the window end, we just update the data like we used to do to our all-up database. Now, checkpoint, I, I'm assuming that uh, some of you are familiar with the term, but checkpoint is basically uh, the way for you to save the state of your application, so the state of your operation, so aggregations in our example, and the offsets you already read from your input source, or Kafka in our example, 
to a persistent location. And Spark Structured Streaming basically manages that for you. So all you need to provide is the location for the checkpoint. And you can see that this slide is much more simplified than the previous one because all we need to do is let Spark Structured Streaming uh, write or persist the state for us. However, however, surprise, surprise, that was enough as well. So we were early adopters. We encountered uh, several major issues in uh, Spark 2.1, which uh, some of them were solved in, la in later versions. I'm not going to cover all of them, but a significant one was uh, the following scenario. So if you had more than a few partitions in your Kafka topic, which is obviously what you usually have, if the application crashed, it, it couldn't uh, uh, recover after that crash. So that was a blocker for us. Another thing is, I mentioned we use S3 for uh, checkpoint location. Now, S3, as probably other uh, blob stores in other cloud vendors, is eventually consistent. So using S3 for checkpointing wasn't straightforward. Now, we tried to use uh, a capability provided by uh, Amazon's uh, EMR, which is called EMR consist EMRFS Consistent View. Uh, don't worry about the terminology. It's just a way uh, for EMR to provide you with, uh, say, a more consistent view of S3. So that worked fine for stateless applications. However, we encountered sporadic issues for stateful applications. So we had to move forward. And for us, moving forward, oh, sorry. Before I cover that, uh, just to summarize the weaknesses and strengths of structured streaming, in my opinion. So strengths include, as I mentioned, running incremental continuous processing, so the state is managed for you. Increased performance via the catalyst optimizer. Massive am amounts of efforts are invested throughout the open source community back in those days and uh, today as well. However, weaknesses were mostly related to maturity. So we had to kind of go back to the future. And for us, going back to the future meant reviving Spark Streaming for stateful use cases as well. Now, same example. You can see that in this uh, phase, what we replaced is we uh, moved back to Spark Streaming applications. And now we only aggregate on the current micro batch. We write the current micro batch result to S3 buckets. And we've also replaced, as you can see, our uh, OLAP engine with Druid. Now, I'm not going to cover Druid in this talk, but basically, Druid is an OLAP database, so it's much, it's much more suitable for those use cases. Oh. Uh. Yeah. OK, that was a lot of spoilers. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so what we've done, uh, we wrote, again, long micro batches of one hour using that Spark streaming application to S3. And periodically, say, every few hours or once a day, we loaded the data into our Druid uh, database. Now, again, I'm mentioning here, and it's important, that we had long micro batches, one hour micro batches. And uh, also, the cluster running the Spark streaming application had to be on 24-7. And this is why I mentioned that, because we couldn't just stop here, right? We had several issues, and let's see what. So the first one was we had significantly underutilized resources in our Spark application, in the Spark cluster, sorry. Now, when you're running on the cloud, probably also on uh, on-prem, but on cloud, you pay as you go, which meant we wasted a lot of money. You can see that for one hour micro batches, this is the CPU uh, graph, by the way, you can see for one hour micro batches, out of that one hour, we had, say, 20, 30, maybe 40 minutes of actually processing, and the rest of the time, the cluster was just idle. Other issues included extreme load on Kafka Bokers disks. Now, Kafka can uh, store only somewhat uh, messages in memory, and the rest of the messages are obviously uh, persisted to disk. Now, when you have large micro batches, like in our use case, of, say, 300 million messages, so every hour, Kafka needs to read from disk and retrieve those uh, 300 million messages uh, uh, for each application. And we had several applications doing those mi long micro batches. So you can imagine how the IO utilization on a Kafka Booker disk looked like. Another thing was we, are we had weird concurrent modification exceptions when using Spark Streaming and Kafka 0.10 integration. So that kind of forced us to use only one core per Spark executor, which is uh, really not uh, uh, performance-wise. And 
we couldn't do other things uh, as, for example, doing multiple operations on the same uh, data set, which was supposedly uh, solved later. Um, and the last thing is, we wish you could run our, um, say, batches even less frequently, because remember, the longer the micro batch, the better aggregation ratio we can get. So, introducing RDR, and RDR is basically our fancy word for our data lake, uh, short for raw data repository. Our data, uh, our data lake is built in the following way. So we have Kafka topic messages stored on S3 buckets in parquet format, partitioned by date. So for example, you can see that the presentation is very up to date. Uh, 2019, October 17th, uh, uh, is one of the folders. The way we read the messages from Kafka and load them into our data lake is through uh, stateless Spark streaming applications, doing only transformations and rather lightweight transformations, and running uh, uh, relatively short micro batches of, say, uh, four or six minutes. And we call them RDR loaders because they just load our, uh, our RDR. And from there, we have applications that can read the data from our data lake for various use cases. So for example, a common use case for us is application that reads or analyzes the data for the last day or the last 30 days. Now the question is, can we leverage our uh, data lake and use it as our data source instead of Kafka? So potentially, yes. Say we are on October 17th today. Oh. So what, uh, what I can do is I can run a Spark batch application, right? Read the folder of yesterday, October 16th, and process the data as I'd like. However, that ignores late arriving events. So enter streaming over our RDR, and basically what we've done is we combined our data lake, Kafka, and Spark to introduce this rather unique, rather unique solution. And let's see how we do it. So how do we stream our DR files? On the producer side, we have those Spark streaming lightweight applications reading messages from Kafka and loading them to our S3 buckets. What they also do is they write the file names that they just wrote to the data lake into designated Kafka topics. So now we have two types of topics. We have those raw event topics, and we have topics with the file names. On the consumer side, I can launch a Spark batch application, however frequent or infrequent as I'd like. And from the Spark driver, I read the file names from those designated Kafka topics. And then I just use Spark read parquet on those file paths in order to read the data from S3 and process the files. If we combine it all together, you can see that this is how it looks like. So we had the RDR loaders reading the raw data from uh, Kafka, writing the files to our data lake on S3, writing the file names to uh, designated Kafka topics. And we have multiple consumers reading those, uh, reading first the file names from Kafka, and then the files themselves from S3. If you use the same example we used throughout this presentation, you can now see that we replaced what we had before with Kafka with uh, uh, the file names and the files themselves on, uh, on our data lake. We have Spark batch applications reading every, uh, uh, running every few hours, aggregating what we call the current batch, and then the same way writing the result of the aggregation to S3 buckets and loading them into our all-up database, which is the read as I mentioned. So did we solve all the aforementioned problems? So first of all, our EMR clusters are now transient because we're running Spark batch applications. They no longer need to be live 24 seven as we had in the Spark streaming applications. So we no longer had uh, idle clusters. You can see in this example that in the previous uh, infrastructure of the Spark streaming application, we had really high costs per day per application and the, and the cost was fixed because the, the cluster was up and running 24 seven and we had to pay for it regardless of how much data it actually processed. In the new infrastructure, you can see that the cost was re were reduced by over 80% and they are also not fixed day by day. Now, a few reasons for that. So first of all, as I mentioned, the EMR cluster is transient, so you only pay for, uh, for the amount of time the cluster actually 
was up and running. And for example, you can see that uh, in day one, we had a little bit less data, then we paid a little bit less. In the second day, we had some more data, so we paid a bit more comparing to uh, the previous day, but again, the costs are much lower. We were also able to leverage spot instances, which is kind of equivalent to, uh, I don't know, Google Cloud preemptive instances, in order to save the costs of those applications because we are comfortable with it because now we're running Spark batch applications and recovery is simpler. So yay to that, uh, significant cost reduction. We also solved the other problem. So we no longer have extreme load on Kafka Booker disk. Now our uh, analytic applications only read the, um, the file names from Kafka. So those file names or those events containing the file names are, might be old and uh, might not be on, uh, in memory still. However, we are only talking about, say, 1K messages per hour rather than 300 million messages per hour. The new infrastructure doesn't depend anymore on, of the on the integration of Spark streaming with Kafka, so we no longer had those weird concurrent modification exceptions. Remember I said that we were just reading the file names using uh, uh, the regular uh, Kafka API from the Spark driver. We can run the, batch the Spark batch applications as frequent or infrequent as we'd like, right? We've seen, we just read the file names and then the file themselves from S3. You can run it every hour, every few hours, every day, however you'd like. And also, we got a built-in handling of late arriving events, right? Because regardless of when the event was written to our data lake, the file name that contains that event was written to the designated Kafka topic, and then our application would read it whenever it uh, uh, was launched. So, yay to that as well. You can see we solved all the aforementioned problems. So to summarize what we've discussed today, we initially started with CSV and standalone Java applications, and we quickly replaced them with Spark, and, uh, Spark Batch and Scala applications. However, we still face the CSV-related issues, mainly the fact that we couldn't enforce the schema on the producer of the files. We introduced Spark Streaming and Kafka for stateless use cases, but we, we quickly needed to handle stateful use cases as well. We tried Spark Streaming for stateful use cases via what we called local aggregations, but that required us to manage the state on our own. We moved to Spark Structured Streaming for all use cases because we thought it would be for our rescue, but uh, we, not, uh, uh, we uh, unfortunately, won't, it wasn't true because cons were mostly around uh, maturity. We went back and revived Spark Streaming for stateful use cases and stateless uh, use cases using Druid as our OLAP uh, database. However, we had the performance penalty in Kafka for long micro-batches. We had significantly underutilized Spark clusters and other things. And lastly, we introduced a, a rather unique solution of streaming over our data lake, which eliminated the Kafka performance penalty. Our Spark clusters are much better utilized, and we had other benefits as well. So just before I wrap things up, a uh, few uh, things we care about. So women in big data. It's a worldwide program that aims to inspire, connect, grow, and champion success of women in big data and analytics field. And there are over 20 chapters and over 14,000 members worldwide. Uh, we actually launched the Israeli chapter about six months ago, and everyone can join regardless of gender. So I, I encourage you to visit the website and just to find chapter near you. Uh, next month, um, my VP and I are going to talk about the way we use Druid in Big Data LDN, so it's uh, uh, about a month from now. And last thing, we have our NMC tech blog where we try to write the interesting things uh, about the interesting things we do in the NMC. That's it for me, and I'll be taking questions now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tai. Very good talk, a lot of streams. So we have a microphone there. You can queue at that microphone, and I will also be walking, walking around with the microphone. Hello. Thank you for this uh, excellent talk. Um, have you, uh, was it smooth and easy to have the right performance you needed on S3? S sorry, what? Uh, was it uh, easy and smooth in your process to uh, achieve the, the, the right performance on S3, or uh, if, you had if we have yeah. performance impact on yeah. S3, or did, or did you manage to, to struggle with the the, the, the size of uh, packet files, etc., etc.? Um, well, I think that mostly speaking, uh, writing to S3 was uh, was okay. 
I mean, uh, it's scalable, so you, you really usually don't have issues. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we can discuss it later, but I think that uh, other than edge cases, writing is fine. Okay, it's lunch, I guess. Uh. <laughs> Maybe just one short question um, regarding consistency. So you write to S3 and you write to another Kafka topic, the file names. Uh, do you have any issues when you write a file name that doesn't exist or vice versa? That, that, that's, uh, that's an excellent question. So the question was, do we have a consistency issue when we write the file names to Kafka and the files themselves to S3? So uh, it's a sh the short answer is uh, no. The long answer is we, had, um, we, have a, uh, we have built a mechanism. It's like we had a, a different talk in Strata. Uh, my colleague gave a different uh, talk in Strata about uh, this entire issue, and we can discuss it later. But basically what we do is we write the offsets uh, both to Kafka and to uh, 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 another database, and that way we kind of mitigate the persistency issue, but I will be happy to elaborate uh, more uh, on the break. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, with the latest approach, when you have file names in Kafka, how do you uh, handle late arrivals? Okay, when so you the question have, was... Mm -hmm. the when question you have file names in Kafka, but the, the actual data is stored in S3. Right, so consider the fact that we are writing each message to a file and writing the file name to the Kafka topic. Now, we consume the messages containing the file names from Kafka like you usually do from Kafka using offsets. So even if I'm running only once a day, I no longer read the files using, uh, using the, the folder name, right? Using just the folder name. I don't rely on the fact that today is the October 17th and I'm reading the date from yesterday. I'm reading the file names from Kafka, so I'm just write, read, reading them as you would normally do with a Kafka consumer, so the offsets are moving as well, so you, you cannot miss like an offset. Uh, you cannot miss the offset on the, of the Kafka, but uh, what if that, uh, uh, the actual uh, events, what uh, should end up in the file later, right, like on one or two minutes later, and it was on, a, on the edge of the day. So th that's not a problem, because again, it was written, th the file was written to our data lake, and the file name was written to the designated Kafka topic. Now, the Spark batch application would just read the file, that file name in the next batch. So you, you should be fine. If it's not clear, then we can. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, hey, uh, uh, I have a question regarding the checkpointing. Yeah. So, in case of a streaming application, so once you checkpoint uh, your data, the state data into a directory, so your code is not uh, something that uh, is persistent, right? You uh, you might want to update the code, and you you are uh, about to release new versions of the code itself. Um, the by code, I mean the Spark streaming application. So, once you you know update your code. Your uh, checkpointing directory is no, more, no, no longer valid, right? Right. So, how do so you it, this goes to the question uh, he, he asked before. We now have a different, it's just a, a, a really wide topic. I couldn't cover that in this talk, but uh, we basically have our own mechanism to handle checkpointing today. Oh. So we no longer relied on, rely on the Spark Swing regular checkpoint mechanism to do that. If I, I forget, just uh, they wanted me to say that please rate my session if you liked it, and if not, you are welcome to DM me, and I'll be happy to get any feedback. Um, yeah, you have, oh, you have my name here and my Twitter handle, so please DM me if you have any feedback, any other questions, and I thank you for being here today. Thank you very much.